welcome to the first episode of the How To Roundtable Talks, presented by Hashtag Murky Books and Beats by Dre. With me, I have Joshua Virasamy, author of How To Change It, Lavinia Stennett, founder of The Black Curriculum, and Tanya Compass, founder of Exist Loudly and Queer Black Christmas. Love that. Welcome, everyone. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Joshua, let's start with the book. OK. How did the idea come about? I'm not even trying to be real, but there's a lot of trash out there. Um, not from our side, but from the other side, there's a lot of people writing stuff that are like quite anti. Mm. So I was like, it'd be good to get something out there that's positive, that's trying to like encourage people to, you know, believe in themselves, that they have power, that they can take action. So here we are today. How did you get from sort of the conception of the idea to the execution of the book? Because saying you're going to write a book and then sitting there and writing a writing book, a book yeah. are two completely different, different stages. Things, yeah. How did you how did you get from the planning to the execution? There was a lot of a lot of learning, to be honest. Like had to humble myself, kind of speak to different people, ask about their processes. You know, what should I do? And they were like, you just need to get the words out mm. first. You know, so mm. at first it was just getting all the thoughts out. You know, I, I've been doing this stuff for like several years, so there was already a lot of thoughts and lessons I wanted to kind of pin down. No matter what kind of writing you do, you want to tell a story. You know, you want to kind of bring people on a journey. And I had to think about my own life stories as well what stuff I want to tell, what stuff I don't want to tell. A lot of it, you know, a lot of it was also, I can't tell a lot of the stories that are really important. Like, for example, um, about disability justice or about accessibility, mm. inclusivity, about um, people who are part of QTPOC struggles. So I had to speak to a lot of people as well and do a lot of learning. Then editing, the editing was a long time, but um, yeah, it was quick as well. This book was a really quick turnover. Like, in the beginning, it was supposed to be a few months, really, you know, um, but then lockdown happened and... Corona for Harris. Um, <laughs> so yeah, but it's been, a, it's been a learning curve, really, you know. Well, we're here to talk about change, which all of you guys are, are very active in, um, doing incredible things in, in several different areas. Tanya, I'd love to speak to you about what, what was that moment when you knew social justice mattered to you, when you knew that this is something that you wanted to actively engage in? Um, I mean, my first job was in the charity sector, was working for a social justice charity, and it was going into schools, people are fair units, colleges, etc., talking to young people about how they can become social, socially active in their community, and it all started through facilitating conversations. So it'd be talking around everything from race, gender, sexuality, um, socioeconomic status, etc., and having so at times which can be very, very difficult, difficult conversations, but also conversations that young people don't necessarily engage with within schools. When I was doing these workshops, the young people loved it, but the teachers always had an issue because then we'd highlight issues within the school. Mm. So you'd ask, you know, you ask a young person what pisses you off within your society, and some young people, it's hard for them to look at like wider society. So you'd be like, okay, cool. What's the community you're a part of every day? School. Mm. What do you see within school? You know, whether it's microaggressions, macroaggressions, etc. And, you know, you, you can see when you're talking to these young people, you get them, make them aware of, of said microaggressions, of things that they go through. It's like, you can see this like almost like you light a fire within them and they're like, mm. OK, what can I do? And a lot of the time that is, you know, actually finding ways in which they can make changes to it, but also putting them in the, the direction of people in which they can listen to and learn from. Um, and with, because of social media, it's so easy to be like, oh, you should follow this person, this group, mm. this, this and this. And I think... That for me was a start and I think through my kind of career in the charity sector and I've been able to facilitate so many wonderful conversations but also had that frustration of working within organisations that are white-led and um, that do want to stay quote-unquote apolitical mm. and that for me was so frustrating mm. and then it kind of got to a point where I was just like fuck it I have to do it by myself yeah and that's where Exist Loudly came from and Queer Black Christmas all kind of come from rage everything was birthed through rage but through this rage, I want to create spaces of joy and community. And that's, I think that's where my outlook of around social justice looks like, is the joy, is the community, is chosen family and things like that. Mm. Because I think it is through these spaces and through community that changes can happen and that great change can happen. So I think, yeah, and that's what I'm just really, really just passionate about doing is allowing young people, creating a space for young people to facilitate the change in their own world. I'm not here to change it for them. I'm here to help facilitate it so they know that they're mm, capable mm. of doing so, which is what you're saying. Like, everyone's got the potential to, make, to change things, but it's allowing allow, lighting that fire. Mm. And I think, OK, cool, rage. And I think also just saying rage is a good thing. And they're always mm. told that rage and anger is bad, but you can really use that as a fuel to make real great change. And I think it's allowing young people to recognise that within What's themselves. That? I really want to revisit the rage yeah. conversation yeah. And, and the resistance. That, that you felt within the schools. Yeah. But I think it's really important also to speak about those, 
the light bulb moment when you felt that you needed to engage um, in, in social justice for you, obviously, was working in charities. Yeah. What was it for you, Lavinia, when you felt you needed to enter this, this area? I think similar to Tanya, it was like studying African studies and having that passion for my lecturers who are African. I think just having African studies being taught to you by Africans is such a powerful thing because they're bringing in their own experience, bringing in their own kind of um, perspective. And I think that's missing when we're studying a lot of the time. I think for me, it was like just feeling like I belonged because mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that space of belonging was missing throughout my whole education. Not seeing yourselves represented in textbooks, not seeing yourselves represented in an accurate light. It just makes you feel like I actually don't belong in this society. Like you don't make that connection there, but that's implicitly what you're, you're, you're mm -hmm. receiving, right? And then when I went to New Zealand um, to do my studies, it was in that classroom space again, learning from Maoris about how they had been excluded from their curriculums in their own land. And I was like, this is an injustice. Mm -hmm. um, it's an injustice here. Um, but I think sometimes it, it, it takes you to understand the uh, magnitude of something when you're outside of your own community, because mm -hmm. you have a different kind of bird's eye view. And I was like, if you come back here and actually start to like, engage and talk about um, belonging in the classroom, it's, yeah, it's so much more powerful. Um, so yeah, I think it was in the classroom for me. Incredible. Yeah. Joshua, what was the, what was the moment for you when you realised that social justice really mattered to you? There's like points that I thought like, okay, that's when I really made the decision, I'm gonna go out and do something. But then when I tried to deep it a bit more, I remember like actually there's people along the way, like for example, I had a geography teacher who taught us about other places in the world and tried to make us understand, you know, things like sweatshops and why there's global disparity in wealth. But you know, I mean, even like when I was young, at that school, or like in my general environment, there was, there was things that felt unfair. Shopkeepers that ban you, feds search, searching you, mm. teachers suspending you, whatever, those kind of things. And you always, from, from young, you have a sense that things aren't right, you know what I mean? But the moment that um, I really started to put two and two together was when I went away. Like after, after college, I decided to kind of, you know, save up some money and go on a little trip and try and see some of the world that that geography teacher was talking about, Mr. Rogers. Big up Mr. Rogers. Um, and I went to Cambodia, I went to Laos, and I saw things that, you know, just are unbelievable. You mm. know, like, in that part of the world, the US dropped more bombs than was dropped during the entire World War, just on one place in a few years, you know? And when you see them things, you just kind of like, rah, they kind of change you. So I come back, um, went to uni, uh, had a complicated time at uni, and there's a lot of racist shit happening at uni, basically. Um, and I was like, fuck this. I'm, I want to like, there's this education that I can have that I'm not getting. So then I just start self-educating. I was like reading a lot, watching a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And at the time, you know, I was reading about like people's history and stuff like that. And at the same time, you know, the Arab Spring was happening. And there was like revolutions, like full scale revolutions happening yeah. across the Maghreb, across the Middle East, across Africa. I was like, I was watching on the TV while I was cleaning the tables and reading my thing like, rah, this is mad. People are actually taking to the thing. And then, and then there was the riots. You know, the social fabric is fragile. Like, things can change very quickly when people are upset. You know, Mark Duggan was killed, people were pissed off. The whole country went to riot. So then I was like, yo, I want to get involved. So I started to like research, like, oh, how do you protest? You know, and I found a few things. So I was just reaching out on Facebook, like, I want to do this stuff. And then they're like, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> um, I was like, I'm just a youth from here. You know? And then I went through and then they basically haven't looked back and I just keep learning, getting involved with stuff. I think like everyone's kind of moment of realization is different, but the thread feels like it was that moment where you mobilized your rage, yeah. your mm. frustration. You realized that you could mobilize it. How do we do that? Like, how do we ensure that our rage isn't aimless and that we're actually translating it into change? I think for me, like when I went to, especially when I went to the Black Lives Matter marches back in like 2016. And this is again, was, uh, when, I was, when I was working, we had this like social justice charity and like we all went together. And you know, there's so much rage there. That rage that I had there translated into me wanting to educate myself. Like even then I went to Black Lives Matter first March and I was still straight at this point. And like I met all these queer like black women and then I started reading books written by queer black women. Mm. And I was like, I, my mind was blown. And obviously now I'm a queer black woman. So I'm just like, it really So there was self-discovery within that. Yeah, within mm -hmm. it. Like you like when you read and you you kind of are empowered with this language that you may not be privy to beforehand. And then you have these conversations with other people. Like I think so many great things can happen um, 
through conversation. Absolutely. Mm. What What do you think we should be doing, Lavinia, with with our rage to ensure that it it is giving us momentum? Because I think rage can rage can stifle you. Rage can absolutely stifle as well, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, how do we make sure? I'd love to know your thoughts on how we make sure that we're allowing it to move us forward. So when I had entered the conversation, it was around race, it was around decolonization. I had done a lot of listening. Um, yeah. And I think it's really important to know when to stop talking yeah. and listen. So I was in these spaces of just like, we literally like change the dynamics as well. So it'd be in a circle. So all the energy is literally coming into the middle, right? And we'd all be kind of like involved and we're all kind of like speaking about the same issues, but from different perspectives. You have really got to just be still and actually understand like the, the thread of what people are saying. What makes us upset? What is that the specific um, example that we can give that is connected to the system and you have to kind of find a very tangible thing because a lot of this is feelings, right? But how does it play out in real life? As Tanya said, once you can identify that in a language um, that means something um, and, and is identifiable outside, you have that kind of, okay, so this is what I'm gonna do next. This is where mm -hmm. I'm gonna go and take my anger. So when I was in uni, it was all about like, you know, the university teeth and the people's money. They weren't, giving, mm. they weren't giving students their bursaries. So we had something clear there to say, actually, well, we're all upset about this. Now we're going to go to the university and ask for the money. And that was the point of, like, we could identify what that thing was, yes. right? And I think, yeah, that is, that is it. It's just knowing how to translate that feeling into something that is practical. Um, but you have to listen. Yeah. You have to listen. I, think, I was thinking about rage last night, actually. It's funny that it came up. I was like, an important thing about rage, because you said it can stifle. Mm. Mm. And I think... The thing about rage is that you can become consumed by rage. Yeah. Mm. And I think rage needs to be twinned with love. Mm. Like when we rage, it's because something that we love is being lost, right? Like something in our community, potential is being lost. Like an opportunity to, to, to joy, to happiness, to be able to express yourself is being lost. And we love that. So we always need to remember what we love as, at the same time and be able to celebrate that yeah. and have bits of it when we can as well as the rage. And I just think that's really important because if, if you stay with rage, like, you'll die. Mm. Yeah. You'll become eaten up, mm. you know what I mean? And yeah, love is important as well. It's like you said, it's all about creating moments of joy. I think without joy, as you said, you can just get so consumed by rage and then you're just sitting with it by yourself, which is why I even protest and I see all these young people go in there and you know, they're so angry and they're so pissed off and rightfully so. But then they go home maybe to a household that isn't ready for these conversations. Uh, maybe for people that are telling them, you know, you shouldn't be doing this and blah, 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 going to schools and schools who are gaslighting young people who are going out mm. to protest. And then you're just pissed off. But then where are you going with that? And that's, yeah. again, you need the joy, you need the love, you need to remind yourself as to why. Because essentially we're all fighting because we want to be able to experience joy, love, etc freely without having to fight for it. We shouldn't have to fight for these spaces, but we do. And I think the fight has to be, as, you, as Josh was saying, alongside the, the, the space and the need for love, for mm. community and for joy. Yeah. yeah, rage is a form of love. I really do believe yeah. that. Mm. It's just a different side of it. Yeah. And it takes community to forge that. Um, RJ Lord speaks a lot about that, like, you know, Andrew. feeling anger. Yeah. And that feeling of anger and not kind of like, seeing it as a negative thing, it's a positive thing because it's a love of humanity. It's a love for wanting to be your full, fullest self. So like we should see it as a good thing. I think a lot of people, um, they kind of, they, they feel this rage, but there are so many things to be angry about. Yeah. As well. like, there's a, there's a like, multitude of issues, you know? For you, it's, you kind of focus your efforts in the experience of, 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 of queer, the queer black experience. Yeah. How, how do you find that area when there's so much to care about? How do you decide, like, this is what I'm going to focus on? Because there are so many issues. I think it's just, again, it's finding out what your why is and where are you best served? Mm. Like, like, what community are you, are, you, are you able to best serve? Like, at my experience in the charity sets, I started working with all young people. And then I noticed that the young people that were really engaging with me were queer black women in particular, young women in particular. And I was like, this is not by accident. Mm. And from that point, I was like, this is why I need to focus my energies because I see how the queer black um, experience is often erased. Like in, in the charity sector, if it's they're doing anything for like the black community, they only want to talk around gun and knife crime. Mm. That's it. Mm. If, you, if you're not talking about gun and knife crime, if you, they don't want to give you funding. Like you can't say, I want to create a program for black boys to experience joy. They're like, what do you mean? Gun and knife crime? Yeah? <laughs> 50 grand for you. Joy? Mm. 
like, no, sorry. And it's like really No budget for joy. No budget for joy. Same way when you go no to like LGBTQ plus programming, it's always focusing on just the queerness, but you can't talk around queerness without talking around the young person's race or gender mm. or socioeconomic mm. status. There's so many other factors you have to take into account. And yeah, it got to a point where I was just like, I know for queer black young people, this is where I'm best served. This is where I know personally, I can bring in all my networks of queer black people and the community that I'm so blessed to be a part of. You don't have to do everything when there's other people that are doing it, have been doing it and will do it. Get so tired in doing this work. So you have to be so passionate about it that nothing's gonna throw you off. I think your purpose will find you. Like there's a difference between serving and knowing your purpose and following that. Through every situation that you're in, mm -hmm. just pay attention because you actually start to see those like small things. You might not recognize it, but it will keep following you. Um, and then another point I have is that you don't have to do everything. So you don't always have to be at the forefront. You can yeah. also serve behind the scenes. You can serve mm -hmm. others. And that is also a form of like finding your passion. You don't have to be at the forefront. Mm -hmm. um, that's how I found mine. I was serving other people. And I realized through that, that okay, my passion is here. So you don't have to start out knowing and doing it all the time. In this age where there are so many optics on, on everything you do, how do you choose what to do? How do you choose where to focus your, your time? You know, to, to jump on, on Audrey Lord and a quote that she has, she's like, um, there's no such thing as a single issue struggle mm. because we do not lead single issue lives. It's not so much like what issue is it you want to choose? It's more like, are you going to do that issue properly? Are you going to do it justice? Are you going to do it in an intersectional way? Do you think you can stretch yourself too thin when it comes to... You've got, yeah, you've, got <laughs> you've got you've got hundred percent. You've got that's that's your sum. If you do fifty percent, you can do fifty percent somehow. Mm. If you try and do one hundred and fifty percent, then you'll go for like five years. You burn out, and then you'll be like, "Fuck this shit." If you're doing something good, mm -hmm. you know, and you're making noise about it, then you're gonna people are gonna place demands on you, and they're not gonna be thinking about you, like your 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 welfare. So you've got to do that yourself. You've got to think, you know, what are my boundaries? It's a, Mm -hmm. incredibly important thing to do, to be able to set boundaries. You, you touched on something actually that I, I, I didn't even think about until this very moment, which is preserving your own peace mm -hmm. while you're doing so much outwardly. How do you do that? So we were having this conversation upstairs about like, say no, mm -hmm. mm. and no, like N-O, without kind of like, but, you know, following after no caveat, that no. just no. Mm -hmm. Just no. <laughs> no. And I think, yeah, sometimes, especially as activists, there's this idea that like, you're so self-serving, you overextend yourself, you're like completely in this mode of servitude that's perpetual and you don't have that break. I think like no helps you to just remember who you are as a person. Like you're not, you're not an angel, um, you know, like you have a, a physical human body that is at some point gonna be tired and you have to respect that. And I think no allows you to kind of preserve that peace um, and holidays. <laughs> like, I've just become really, I don't publish them, but at the same time, I'm just like, we all need breaks, um, particularly in an environment that, like, Babylon is, is coming at full force, 100% all the time, like, it doesn't mm -hmm. stop. So, like, we also need to be, be wary of that. Um, and I think for me, it's just like, I, I like holidays. I like to kind of, like, just, just tap out and not just have any kind of body email me, text me, like, antisocial. So I think it's really important to just remember, like, what you, what you like. Um, and be unapologetic in that. No is, is, is so important. I think there's no, because people expect so much of you and it's like, mm. okay, you must be here for everybody, but it's like, you have to be there for yourself as well. And I think it's a question that you always have to reflect on and like, is now the right time to jumpstart things? Like even when it came to when COVID hit and I was like, in my head, I was like, okay, I have to do something to support queer black young people right now. But at the same time, I was also dealing with the fact that all of my work got canceled and I didn't know how to pay my rent. And I was, and I was like, I don't know what to do. Like I was mentally impacted by it. And then I was like, you know what? I'm gonna sit back and I'm not. I'm actually gonna to choose to not do anything. And then when I was ready to do so, when, I was, when I've had the time to rest, to read, mm. to just reflect on where I would be best serving the community, that's when I started the Exist Loudly Fund. And that's when, you know, that blew up. And now I've got a, now I've got a whole organization that I never had pre-corona. And that's because I took the time and I took the time for myself. So I knew that when I started it, I was ready. Yeah, the no is definitely always pivotal. So the power of no, we realise, is, is important. But Joshua, you, you write about how to change and how to change the world. How do you ensure your self-preservation while trying to outwardly change things? I think, it's, I think it's really similar to what's been said, to be honest. I think I'm really glad you mentioned therapy because, you know, there's a lot of stigma around therapy um, from all communities. But I think 
you know, therapy's like worked for some people. I know it hasn't worked for other people, but the idea of therapeutic work, mm -hmm. like doing something therapeutic that is just for yourself, you know what I mean? Like for whatever, whatever it is for you, finding that thing, whether it might be going to therapy. I guess processing trauma is really important as well. Like, yeah. you know, Babylon, part of what it does is 100% is 100% a, a trauma. Like all the time is finding ways to traumatize you, big and small. Mm. So making time to kind of process that trauma is just pivotal. And the holiday thing like cannot be, uh, like, under, cannot be overstated. Like yeah. rest is just so pivotal. Babylon is about like one of the, one of the, the diseases it gives you is workaholism. Yeah. Mm. Like we overwork as work. Do you know what I mean? Overwork is normal, but that's like, you see any, any other thing overwork, you overwork a car, it breaks. You, you don't see animals overwork because they're just smart. <laughs> but so rest, like it's just, it's just, it's medicine. Um, again, it's like an ordinary law, like love center, but it's like she has a quote again, it's like self-care is an act of political warfare mm. because people expect you to be grinding all the time and to be working all the time. So when you say, nah, this is for me, that's a political act other people will work you to the bone. Mm. Um, and then who's gonna, who's, who's gonna have you? And that's when you have to be like, you know, this is, I'm having me time. And be, and be, yeah, just unapologetic about it. You guys are giving out gems today. Tanya, you've spoken about resistance, right? You spoke about um, in the education system, coming up against resistance from teachers. How do you remain motivated when there are these agents of opposition at all times. <laughs> it's gonna sound so bad, but if a teacher gets pissed off by what I've spoken about, I know I've done a good job. I go in there and I'll talk about especially the queer black experience. And after I got a DM from a young person and she was like, do you know the teacher afterwards, um, like a white male teacher went in after the black, do you don't know why she didn't talk about any, any white LGBT people, da da da. And the students, because of what I said in the workshop, had the words to tell him about himself. And it's like, that for me, I said, yes. <laughs> like, that for me is a job well done. I want to make people feel uncomfortable. I'm not here to make feel people, people feel comfortable. I'm not here to make people, to make teachers and schools, etc., feel like they're doing enough, because they're not. There are good teachers, don't get me wrong. There are some, most of the time when I get into these schools, it's because of a good teacher. But again, even for that one teacher, after that point, there is, they do get black backlash from the, from the other teachers. You'd be like, how did the person come and talk, come and get into the school? But that one teacher then gets a backlash of it. And it, it is hard for those that are, do want to do good work, especially in the education system, because there's so many barriers for them doing it. But it's, yeah, I don't know, just the, I will always do it. Like, I'm, I will always do it. I, I honestly, I, it's like a drug to be told that a teacher's pissed off at me. I'm like, yeah. Tanya, you made a really powerful point, which is you're not here to make people feel comfortable. Yeah. Mm. And I think that's so important. You know, change is born of discomfort. Yeah. But it is such a long fight. These, these aren't things that are going to change overnight. How do you, Lavinia, how do you maintain that motivation? I'm just optimistic. I think surrounding myself with optimistic people as well is part of that as well, because there's this idea that like, you know, Babylon don't change, it's never gonna mm. like be brought down. I'm like, well, no, we can actually reimagine the world yeah. and we can actually start to do that by thinking and starting that work um, and continuing building off previous work that has happened. So I think just surrounding yourself with a community of people. Um, and also it's motivating for me to see um, other people who are also really, really passionate um, because they are, like they stretch themselves, you know? I think when you enter this work, there's this idea that like, you, there's, the, there's no cap on learning, like you continue to learn. And I think it's really good to, to be around people who, who have that. It's like, that's never enough, let's go the step further. Um, and yeah, I just think rebellion is at the heart of like, it's in our blood, mm. you know, I can't step away from it. So I think it's just part of who we are as people and just the environments that we're in. Is there, is there a piece of advice that has been given to you by an activist or, or anything that you carry with you? Yeah, I love speaking with older people because there's just so much wisdom. So one advice, piece of advice I got, I think like two years ago was that um, we need to approach everything as if it's gonna work. I think when you enter into something with the mindset that like, oh, it's, it's done, it's done out here, I can't do anything, there's no change that's gonna happen, it won't happen. So you've really got to make yourself believe that it's possible. Joshua, what about you? Is there a, a piece of advice that an activist has given you or just some gem that you, that you carry with you? There's two. One is like curiosity mm -hmm. is the highest virtue. It comes back to kind of an earlier point you made, which is like, you know, when we say Babylon, we're talking about Rastafari. 
and they're talking about a 400 year old system. It's been around for a while and we've been fighting it for a while and there's a lot of wisdom out there and there's a lot of like struggles that we can learn from, you know, like, so that means you just need to be a bit humble and think there's a lot to learn. And so you're always going to be learning. So curiosity is, is important. You need to stay curious and keep learning. Mm. But the other, the other one that kind of sticks with me a lot and I, I got it tattooed on my, across my chest is to kind of, in summary, like solidarity is our superpower. Mm -hmm. And for me, that means like, I always try to come back to that. You know, it's such a like basic saying, but divide and rule is how they keep us downpressed. So the opposite of divide and rule is coming together. You know, and like my favorite chant that you hear on protests all around the world is the people united will never be defeated. And so solidarity is about recognizing that actually, you know, there's lots of animosity between different communities in this country, but when you live side by side, despite what we're told about how each other is, we recognize that there's a shared humanity. You know what I mean? We buy from each other, we live around each other, and that thing, that kind of like shared humanity, that common struggle, that's the most important thing. And I try to come back to that. That's what I'm trying to, I'm trying to do. I'm trying to bring people together mm -hmm. so we can, because if we don't come together, we ain't going to win. Yeah. You know what I mean? If we don't find a common cause, we're going to lose. And I'm always trying to come back to solidarity. And Tanya, for you. There's a book called Emergent Strategy written by someone called Adrian Marie Brown. And the book is absolutely incredible. And it talks around, just around, coming together as communities and how to, again, make this work long lasting. And she talks about part of it around like radical imagination and then touches on Octavia Butler. Mm -hmm. And this idea that, again, we've been taught to kind of just accept things as they are. But as Lavinia was saying, like, you have to imagine beyond the sudden circumstances. If you can't imagine a life in which you're free, then what's the point in doing the work? What's the point in the fight if you think that this is going to stay the same consistently? So I think that for me to, like, it always starts, you know, you can put one almost, yeah, one idea can start as like a drop in the ocean and then suddenly that one drop in the ocean is what creates the waves and then you'll see at the end of a beach, however long ago, some massive wave that started mm -hmm. as a drop. And you have to think that maybe one conversation or something that you've read that sparks a conversation is that drop, drop in the ocean and then it kind of carries on from there. And I think the other piece of advice was something I heard from um, Angela Davis and she was just saying that always listen to young people. And I think that there's this idea that, you know, you get to a stage, you know it all, boom. And especially mm. me as working as a youth worker, as much as I say I'm a young person still, I'm like almost 30. So <laughs> there's, and there's so much different. There's so much, even between those people that are like, what, six, seven years younger than me, there's so much difference in terms of how, um, how their lives are. And, what, and so I always have to listen to young people. Young people are always at the forefront, which is why even with Business Loudly, for me, it was really imperative to do a research project looking into queer black young people's lives from the ages of 12 up until 23. Mm. So I paid these young people, I put grants away for me to know that I, my work is informed by these young people. It radically imagine things and also listen to people, whether it's mm. of the community in which you're serving. So for me, that's young queer black people. So I need to listen to young people, but for other people in obviously different realms in which you exist in, know that you're not always going to be the one to know it all and other people's struggles, even though you may look the same, may be very, very different to, to one another. So you have to, again, listen. You always have to mm. listen as well. Thank you, Tanya. I think that's the perfect note to end on. And remember, you can grab your copy of Joshua's book on Apple Books. The links are in the description. And get in touch in the comments. Let us know what your main takeaway from that episode was. We'd love to hear from you.